Okay, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. How are you? Good. Um, so my name is Mosa Mushabela, the Dean and Head of School, Nursing and Public Health. And uh, cool. I'm cool. here together Thanks. with our colleagues from infectious diseases and uh, virology, clinical virology as well. So we, we're going to try and we, we we're going to try and give you an overview of COVID-19 and, uh, and try to address any questions you might have, concerns you might have. And hopefully by the end of the session, you would feel comfortable, competent, and confident to, to deal with COVID-19, right? I want to emphasize the fact that um, even for us, it's a learning curve. Every day, there's something new that's coming up that we are learning, and so we're going to learn together. And there might be something that you already know that you have read that we are not aware of. Please share that knowledge. It's important uh, in terms of how we organize um, ourselves. But from uh, UKZN side, um, we decided about a week before the first case was uh, diagnosed to put together a response team. And it was in anticipation of the fact that looking at the patterns uh, globally, we were likely to have a case at some point. And looking at the pattern globally, we are also likely to have an outbreak at some point. And so it is important then that we prepare ourselves. And a lot of the preparedness starts largely with uh, awareness, information, making sure that we know uh, what this animal is. We know what to do, and we know how to handle it. And that was our plan. And personally, I was kind of projecting that we've got up until end of March without a case. I was wrong. We now have seven cases as of today. So fortunately, the cases that we have, we would call them isolated cases, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the issue is that um, it's important that we accept, uh, you know, a lot of the times we just hope that it's not going to happen. It's important that we accept that it's here. Um, and we need to make sure that we are equipped to, to, to handle it. Again, on, on the university side, uh, we've, after many discussions and, and so forth, we kind of decided to focus on three broad areas, right? One is that of surveillance and kind of monitoring, tracking what's going on, where the patterns are and how they are moving, and really kind of tracking the, the pandemic globally, in Africa, nationally, and in KZN. And we also have an intention to track it on campus as well. In fact, that was our initial, uh, our main focus when we started, to track it on campus. But we're also tracking literature, new emerging evidence, trying to see what new evidence is emerging, what new information, what new insights are emerging. And every time we kind of learn something new, we try and incorporate in our understanding and our approach in terms of how we are organizing ourselves. And so surveillance is one thing. Then the other thing really is the clinical response. A lot of, the, a lot of what the, the Department of Health has done has really been around preparing for the clinical response component. So starting with a point where someone is a, uh, has had contact or exposure and uh, is sort of uh, concerned that they might have uh, COVID-19, and they would quarantine them and so forth and monitor them for the duration of the incubation period and so forth. But also, most importantly, the point where someone fits the case definition and they are tested and they are diagnosed and they are isolated and treated. So a lot of the preparations have been around that. And generally, we, just call, it, we call that the sort of clinical response. By the nature of it, you understand that the clinical response is sort of a step where someone is already, has already had contact with COVID-19 or someone has already been um, infected with COVID-19. 
We are also interested, therefore, in the third arm of the response, which is the population response and the public health, more the public health response, which emphasizes health promotion and prevention. We don't necessarily have a health system generally in the country that is equipped to respond to a major outbreak of, of COVID-19, especially when you look at the uh, size of the burden with severe cases that would need to be managed, especially when you think about the fact that uh, even the health workers themselves uh, could be exposed and may need to be treated as well. So we don't really have the strong capacity to respond to a major outbreak. And we are betting on a much stronger response in terms of prevention and, and breaking transmission as much as possible. We will eventually have cases that are severe enough to require treatment and some of them severe enough to require intensive care as well. But we still have to try to teach people how to try and break transmission. And of course, you will see as we discuss that it is not something that we are good at in terms of taking basic measures of, of preventing transmission. When we start talking about exactly how the virus is spread and what we need to do to, to prevent uh, the spread of the virus. So those are the three pronged, that's the sort of three pronged approach. And within that, there is a whole lot of uh, health communication uh, uh, messages that we are trying to put together. There's a lot of uh, health behavior change and, and, um, and practice change that we are trying to, to emphasize. And, you know, uh, many of you would be thinking, you know, why don't you give us the N95 mask? Why don't you give us this? And why don't you give us that? But there is a lot that you can do with very little. And that's what we are betting on. It's not that we will neglect the more sort of um, intensive response in terms of measures and equipment and gear and so forth, in terms of P PPEs. But the, our response we, we, in general, we've uh, adopted it from the way Singapore has responded, and it's a four-level response. And we're trying to think of different stages of the, of, of, of the outbreak. At the first level, you don't necessarily have a case. There are things you can do when you don't yet have a case. A lot of it is preparation, a lot of it is awareness, and a lot of it is really starting to promote positive behaviors. The second level is go when you've got isolated cases, cases that we know where they originated from, the cases that are important, or cases that come from close contacts of those who basically imported the, the, the infection from elsewhere. So those contacts are then uh, also considered isolated cases together with the, with the index, okay? We will know when when we know travel history of a person, when we know contacts of a person, and we are able to map it through surveillance, and we are able to trace all the contacts and contain it, it is still more of an isolated case. We call that level two in the way that we have organized our response. In level three, it's when we start to have a case or cases uh, for which contact we don't know, They've got no travel history. Somehow they caught it elsewhere. Then we start to assume that we're having community transmission, that the virus is now circulating more generally. And when we start to have community transmission, it can start off in a localized area, or it can be sort of in a broader area. But the idea is that community transmission is happening. People are picking up the virus without actually no specific contacts or specific travel history. Level four is when we start to have more widespread uh, transmission happening. And even the response that we put in place at level four might require more sort of extensive or aggressive uh, measures like closing down institutions. In level three, we could, depending on the nature of the, of the community transmission, we could put in place partial closure of, of certain institutions depending on sources and so forth. But that requires epidemiological mapping and surveillance to be able to make those decisions. But 
at level four, then this is when we start to say, well, schools have to close down, campus must close down, but that is at level four. You understand? So we are hoping that this sort of approach will help to give us some sort of rational response to, to, the, to the pandemic as it kind of continues to grow and spread. But we, we want to, it's important that we avoid a situation where you start taking measures for level four when you are still in level two. If you don't have a plan, a response plan, it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to be in level two and panic and start engaging in level four measures. But if you have planned in, advi in advance and you, you take lessons from countries that have had a much more rational and effective response like Singapore and Hong Kong, then you are able to see that actually you, know, you need to have a plan on how to respond. And all institutions need to have a, a, a measured response to, to, the, to the epidemic. Responding to an, a, to an epidemic or a pandemic can be very disruptive. It can disrupt people's lives. It can disrupt um, the functioning of society, which is why it's important that we don't just get ahead of ourselves. I just want to also mention that we are health workers. We are the ones in the front line. There is a lot of risk that comes with that. And there is also a lot of responsibility that comes with that. Okay. We are the ones who are going to reassure our patients. We are the ones who are going to reassure society. We are also the ones who are going to make sure that we give correct messages. There is a lot of misinformation happening. We have to fight against misinformation. Because if we don't do that, it is our health systems that are going to break um, when this, people start to panic. It is us as health workers who are going to be exposed to risk when people start rushing in and panicking and the stampede if we don't fight against misinformation. It's important that you empower yourself with the right information. It is important that you use the right information to make decisions as best as you can. Okay? And maybe, maybe we might be able to go through the winter and survive and cope. But if we don't do that, when winter comes, we're going to be overwhelmed because the virus is going to spread much more efficiently when the weather is cold. At the moment, we are still in a stage where we've got a warm climate and we might be able to just kind of have few cases, but we need to start preparing now for a worst case scenario. That's my view. People have said that I'm overreacting, and I accept that I am guilty as charged. But at the same time, I think that I would rather be prepared. We are seeing systems buckling under pressure, even in Italy, in places where you would have thought that they are very strong health systems. They are not able to contain it and to control it. What, what is it that makes us, what is it that would make us think that we are any special or different? But our best bet would be to try and age, educate society as much as possible not to transmit. And that whatever transmission that takes place after we have taken those measures is something that we might just be able to cope with. Okay. So I'm going to ask my colleagues to basically give you a brief overview of COVID-19 and then we can have discussions as we're going along um, and take it from there. Uh, so I'm Richard. I am an infectious diseases doctor and a researcher. I work at CRISP, which is one of the research centers at the university. Um, and um, also with, with us is probably, you know, Prof Musa, the head of infectious diseases. And then Lily. Hi, I'm Lily Gounder. I'm one of the clinical virologists in the Department of Virology at Nkosi Albert Lutuli Central Hospital. Um, and I'm affiliated with the University of KwaZulu-Natal. So what we want to do is just, just spend a little bit of time just informing you about this new disease, the virus and the illness that it causes. 
because like like prof said one of the things that we're asking of you and one of the reasons that we're keen to come up and talk to you here is because of the responsibility the role you play in society as respected members of society um, one of the challenges with dealing with this epidemic already is countering all the fear and the misinformation that spreads much more quickly than the virus spreads and we believe that you have a strong positive role to play there hopefully um, and so part of this is just getting you up to speed as quickly as possible with some of the key things to know about about this illness and, and, and this virus so that you have the information you can share with with your families with with your communities um, and just to kind of add to what prof was saying I think by, by this time, as, as fifth years, hopefully you've recognized one of the great skills of a, of a good doctor is taking a calm, rational, evidence-informed approach to dealing with a problem. Whatever type of doctor you want to be, a neurosurgeon, a trauma medic, or a boring infectious diseases specialist, um, the best doctors that you'll recognize are people that take a, a calm approach to problems, that don't panic, that don't kind of get flustered in a difficult situation. And when you deal with epidemics and outbreaks, it's, it's similar on a much bigger scale, that together as a health system, we're challenged to, however frightening something may be, the, the best approach is to be calm, rational, evidence informed and to, to, to take your decisions based on that. And that's part of what we're doing as a team is to try and um, get everybody around us in the province thinking in that way so that, so that we're acting appropriately together and not just panicking, getting flustered and thinking we can't do anything about this problem. So just to start with, I just want to make sure that everybody's clear about the terminology that we use when we're describing this, this infection and the virus that causes it. So the, the disease itself is what is being called COVID-19, and that just stands for coronavirus disease. 2019 was the date that, it, that this first emerged in the human population. And the virus it has been termed the SARS-CoV-2, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Related Coronavirus 2. And Lily will tell you a bit more about that name. Um, so just so, you, to, so that you're clear, although you'll hear us sometimes use these terms interchangeably, we've got one term for the disease and one for the virus. So Lily's going to tell us a little bit um, that you need to know about the virus itself. Okay, so the coronavirus, the one that we are speaking about is the, the SARS-CoV-2, which is the responsible for COVID-19. But um, it belongs to a group, a family of coronaviruses. MERS belongs to this family as well, and the original sars coronavirus belongs to this family as well. So um, the reason why it was labeled or named SARS-CoV-2 was because of its relatedness to the other viruses, not necessarily because it has exactly the same um, disease uh, uh, presentation or spectrum. Okay, so the virus, like any other virus, needs to reside within a cell in order to replicate. Now this virus um, has an affinity for the receptor, on cells we have receptors and viruses attached to receptors. So this virus has an affinity for uh, the receptor that is found in the lower respiratory tract. It is called the ACE2 receptor. And so that is why um, even when we go further and speak about the symptoms and you will note that it tends to cause more pneumonia-like pictures because it has an affinity for the uh, lower respiratory tract. So the, the, the coronavirus itself is an enveloped virus. There are different types of viruses. We have non-enveloped and enveloped. The enveloped viruses are much more easily destroyed than the non-enveloped 
viruses. So that is actually good because uh, this can be easily destroyed by things like uh, simply washing your hands with soap and water. You can destroy the virus by doing so. Cleaning surfaces with a 70% alcohol spray or even a concentration, a specific concentration of bleach will remove this virus. So uh, even uh, direct sunlight will remove this virus. Temperatures of uh, around 56 degrees Celsius will remove this virus. So it's good to know that this virus can be uh, easily removed. Um, what is important to bear in mind is with the previous um, this family of coronaviruses has different spectrum of diseases. Coronaviruses are common throughout the world. Majority of them are responsible for the common cold. But then from time to time you have a coronavirus that will emerge and the reason for this is the reservoir for the coronavirus is the bat. And then when there is interaction between bats and other animals and then humans, we have an emerging virus which then crosses species. So initially from the bats, the, the original coronavirus may then infect an intermediate uh, animal or host, and then within that animal, uh, mutations can occur when it enters the cells of that animal. It may cause a mild disease in that animal, but those mutations uh, allow the virus to then develop abilities to cross species and then enter a human. Okay, so that is how we had the emergence of SARS in 2003, then the, the, the subsequent emergence of MERS, that one happened in the Middle East, SARS initially occurred in China, and now we've got SARS-CoV-2, which now has emerged in China again. Um, also to bear in mind, with the previous emergence, we had, it took some time for diagnosis, it took some time for testing. Here, because of the technology that we have available to us, within a few weeks of the initial cases, uh, the entire genetic, um, the genetic makeup of this virus was known. The entire RNA sequence was known. So it was very easy then for companies to then take these and then start producing um, primers and probes, which is part of molecular testing, to then uh, be able to pick up this virus. So we have diagnostic tests readily available, very much more quicker than previous times. Okay, um, do you have any questions about the virus? Okay. So what type of disease is this that's jumped from animals to humans? What, what do we give, what name do we give to? Zoonotic. Okay, great. Okay. What? So I don't know how closely you're all following this this outbreak, but who can tell me what is the clinical illness that is characteristic of COVID-19? Acute respiratory distress syndrome. So everybody that has COVID-19 gets ARDS. I'm aware that ARDS is a complication. It's a complication. It's a feature. Okay, good. We'll park that and come back to it. But if I asked more generally, what's the, what's the characteristic presentation of COVID-19? What would you say? Sorry, we have to keep holding this around for the audio. Fever and cough. Fever and cough. Perfect. 100%. Um, the, 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 the most typical presentation is with just fever and dry cough, okay, in the majority of cases. One of the things that, that you heard was Lily say that this preferentially um, infects cells in the lower respiratory tract as opposed to the upper tract. So what you see is when you look at the symptoms, the, the classical runny nose, blocked nose, sore throat is not all that common, okay? And so that's why it's predominantly just a dry cough and fever. The shortness of breath comes a bit later as the illness progresses a few days, and if you're developing a more severe illness, then you, you will get the shortness of breath. And then to some extent, you've got the classical flu -y symptoms of fatigue and myalgia and arthralgia and headache and things, but even these are not so common and you, won't, you, you, you may not see them in the majority of cases. Um, how severe is, the, what's the pattern of severity of this? So 
somebody in your family asks you, how, how bad is this? Are we, are we all going to die from COVID-19? Or are we making a fuss about nothing? Are we all just going to have a, a, a common cold and, and be better in a couple of days? What, what's your answer to them when they ask you that? Nobody's asked you that? They have asked you, so you, so you just stare at them blankly? <laughs> or you make something up? Or what do you say to them? It's just a bad flu. Yeah. How bad? Not very bad, as it is said. <laughs> Not very bad. Yeah, it is in the media, but yeah. Okay. It is bad because it is transferred quickly from one person to another. Okay, that's an excellent some point. some people will die from it, so that is Okay. Can we quantify it in some way? So if I asked you, um, how, how many, roughly what proportion of people will have a more severe illness? And, and what proportion will die? I, I don't want to pick a, <laughs> say again. Um, I think 40%. 40% will have, will die. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. I mean, we, we hope not. We hope, we hope our clinical care is not that bad, but, but uh, let's see. Um, okay, so, so let me give you a, a relatively simple way to do it. And again, this is based on our understanding at the moment. All our understanding changes on a daily basis. But if you want a simple answer to, the, to that question that we asked, then my answer to it is, most people, about four in every five people who get this infection, will have a mild illness or be asymptomatic and will recover fully. Yeah? But about one in five people will have a more severe illness. And of those, a, a small proportion will be critically unwell, may need intensive care, and some of those will die. How many of you have checked up on this disease on the internet? Can you just raise your hands? Just hi, so we can see. So most of you are, because a lot of this, what we are saying, we've learned this from the internet. So, I mean, you should know many of these answers, no? <laughs> so, as we say, this, this is not the same everywhere, it depends on the stage of the epidemic. It depends on the public health approach that's being used there, how early cases are being identified, how many people with fewer symptoms are being tested and diagnosed, or whether it's just the really sick people that end up in the hospital that are being tested. As an example, Italy at the moment that Prof mentioned, Italy is now over 10% 10, 10 of their cases are needing intensive care. Okay, so they're seeing a really severe uh, pattern of illness there and it's overwhelmed their, their health care system and, and their intensive care units are not, are not coping. So we don't really know what, what we will be faced with here when, when the epidemic really starts to accelerate. Again, you'll have probably heard that um, it's in China, certainly, it was affecting the older population. So the average age was around 50. Um, there was a slight preference for males. Um, and it seemed that children were not getting infected, or certainly they weren't seeing children presenting with illness. So what, what do you guys think? Do you think that children were not getting infected? Or do you think they weren't presenting? What do you think is going on there? What I understand is that um, more children have, their children have been having a more milder or asymptomatic illness. So they're not actually getting, potentially getting picked up at all. Yeah, so I think initially the people were thinking, or oh, it may be that they're not getting infected, but, I, but there's now some pretty good evidence where they've done kind of systematic contact tracing and tested 
a huge number of contacts of cases and they find that the children are getting infected at much the same rate as, as adults, but it's just they're not getting unwell. They're, they're, they are largely, or not largely, but a lot of them are asymptomatic or, or posse symptomatic. Yeah? So it seems that it's not that they're not getting infected, it's just that they're infected but more likely to be well. No, I just want clarity on that 4,021 cases. Oh, sorry. So that's just, that's just saying this study, what, what's being described here, was just one study of about 4,000 cases. Sorry, it's not meant to say there's only four, been 4,000 cases. It's just this, this was one published study that kind of gave in detail the, the profile of the, of the cases. Um, so what about the, f the mortality or, or what you've probably heard referred to as the case fatality rate? So we talked about the severity and things, but the question that's asked, uh, how many of us will die? What, what proportion of people who get it will die? Countries to country differ because of the, the number of cases they diagnose, so yeah. it's not the same. So it's different across different countries, isn't it? Because it depends on your testing system, on your health system. Yeah, I was going to say the same Say the thing. same. But do we have a, a, some kind of range where the, where the case fatality sits? The number I've been hearing is always 2, 2%. Two okay. Does that sound reasonable to people? Is that other people's understanding? Yeah, I mean, that, that's reasonable. Um, what, what we are saying here is that the overall rate is estimated between 1 and 3%. So your 2% is in the middle of that. If you look at what the World Health Organization is reporting, they're reporting that it's currently about 3.4%. But theirs is a, is a crude estimate just based on how many deaths there have been up till now divided by the number of confirmed cases there have been up till today. So it's, a, it's an imperfect measure of, of the severity, but it's kind of what we have at the moment to track. And as you say, it differs quite a lot. So if you look at South Korea, their case fatality rate is well under 1%. And that's because they're, they're going out, doing masses of testing, finding lots of cases that are less severe. So, so the, one, the proportion that are dying is low because they're finding a lot of cases uh, in the population. One of the key questions that's being asked and, and something there's a lot of confusion about, unfortunately, and so it's one of the key things we want you to take away is how does that compare to flu, to seasonal flu? So what is the case fatality from normal seasonal flu? This side is very quiet, so I'm going to start picking on you. I mean, the answer is on the slide, so it's not, it's not the hardest of questions, but... <laughs> so, do, so, so do you see here, it's a seasonal influenza. So our estimate of the case fatality of seasonal influenza is 0.1%. So about one in a thousand people die. Maybe a bit less than that, maybe a little bit more. It's difficult to estimate accurately. But that's kind of the quoted figure. So even if the case fatality rate of COVID is 1%, at the lower bound of what we're saying it might be, that's still a tenfold higher than seasonal flu. If it's closer to 3%, then that's 30-fold higher than seasonal flu. So you might have heard prominent politicians on the news over the weekend saying that this was much less severe than seasonal flu because they said the mortality from seasonal flu is 50%. And these are people the public will hear and listen to and get information from. And so that's key for us to understand our role to know these kind of things. 
you might say, why do I need to know that? I'm, I'm a medical student, I'm learning how to be a doctor, not relevant to me, but it's relevant because of all this misinformation that's out there. And because again, it's, it's something relatively simple that, that you all have brains big enough to hold this information. And, and so when people ask you or when people say, no, no, Doc, I, I've heard this, this, is, this is much less severe than flu. You can, in a very simple way, explain, actually, that's not the case. We know that this is at least tenfold higher mortality compared to seasonal flu, and maybe even more than that. Um, I just have a question. With the seasonal flu season approaching, and let's just say we go from level two to level three, how do we advise or like what would you tell like the GPs to advise their patients who come in with the flu? Would they all have to get tested or? So, so great question thinking forward. I think what's likely to happen by then is that we will have more spread here and that the testing will become more routine. And what you'll probably end up with was, will be that there'll be routine testing for flu and, and coronavirus side by side. So you'll get somebody presenting with an acute respiratory illness and you'll send off the swabs and the lab will test for both, both flu and coronavirus. W would you agree, Lily? Um, I mean, we're, we're projecting here, yes. but I think... That's the likely scenario. Yes. For now, uh, we have centralized testing, and that's uh, done at the NICD, National Institute for Communicable Diseases. That's the laboratory in Johannesburg. So they are gatekeeping the test. So we're very strict to adhere to the current case definition, which says includes a travel history or contact with an individual who has COVID-19. But if we have to then project, and should this, um, uh, this outbreak then reach a point where we have ongoing local transmission or community transmission, then one would need to consider um, not uh, uh, decentralizing. In fact, we are in the process of decentralizing these tests and then more routine testing like what Richard has suggested. And what we'll end up with is this, this test, this PCR will just become part of your respiratory multiplex PCR with, for respiratory viruses and will just become normalized. But that's that's in the future when, when this kind of initial epidemic is, is uh, settling. Um, any questions about the infection and the illness and the severity, the mortality, or is it, is it clear enough to you? It's not really a question, but I'm thinking with the, the, the estimates of influenza might have been taken whilst influenza was in season and then Coronavirus is not yet in season, so it might have been even might be even worse than uh, influenza by comparison. Good, good point. Although where where the epidemic has started and spread to initially is kind of more the winter in the northern hemisphere. It has been winter, which is what they're kind of hanging on the hope that if they can kind of delay things until summer, that that's going to help them control things. We don't know whether that's the case. We don't know whether there's going to be any difference in the seasons. That is to tell. But that's one of our concerns here is as we move into winter, is, is, is that when things will really accelerate here. So again, we don't know. Um, but you're right in, in saying the mortality differs. And, and this is purely talking about the normal seasonal flu. Mortality from outbreaks of, of avian flu and, and things can be different. Uh, yes. Thank you, Doctor. Um, just regarding the uh, case fatality rate, um, in South Africa, uh, regarding our high burden of uh, TB and HIV, can we expect significantly higher case fatality rates than those seen in other countries? Yeah, so great question. What, what do you think? What's your prediction? I, I would imagine that that would be the case. And why do you think that? Um, I think um, as if chronic lung disease have been shown to increase the risk of, risk of death, then I would imagine, especially in TB patients, that, that would apply as well. 
Yeah, so mm -hmm. certainly people with TB or, or just people with previous TB who have chronic lung disease as a result. The HIV, we really don't know. We have nothing to tell us at the moment, no data to say wh whether the illness is more severe, less severe in HIV. Can you think of a reason why it might be less severe, possibly, in HIV? If I asked you to make an argument that it might be less severe. I mean, I have no idea what patients are on antiretrovirals, so uh, okay. not to say that it's a treatment, but it may confer some level of maybe resistance. Okay. Their decreased immune response might actually benefit them in having a decreased respiratory response and not making their severe respiratory distress as bad as it would be in someone with yeah. a normal immune system. And, and we were saying that the children seem to be having less severe illness and we presume, we don't know, but we presume that may be because they they're, have a less mature immune response and that's why they're not getting so symptomatic. So if that's the case, you could make an argument that HIV may be similar. But, but like you say, most of our people living with HIV now are on treatment and, and not so heavily immunosuppressed. So time will tell, but basically we don't know. So if somebody asks you that question, you're at full liberty to say, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, Lily's going to tell us a bit about the spread, the transmission of the virus. And this is really important to understand because it plays into, into then um, what's going to happen here and it comes to our testing and, and who we identify as uh, people that might have been exposed. Um, as with any virus, when you think about the viral pathogenesis, there's viral entry, then it spreads, localizes, and then it sheds. So with um, this virus, it enters via the mucosal membranes, um, particularly then has an affinity for your respiratory epithelium. Remember, it has to get through the mucosal membrane, uh, the barriers, I should say, and then uh, meets the innate immune response. Um, if it can overcome the innate immune response and then you are able to mount an adaptive immune response, your body is able to fight it. We mentioned in the other individuals who are immunosuppressed or um, have chronic lung disease, there may be issues with their immune response, okay? So once it localizes in the respiratory epithelium, the virus itself is either, um, it, uh, it, it either causes destruction of the, the cells or it induces the immune response to cause a cytokine storm, and then that will result in the features that you have of fever and so forth, right? So it, that, that's the aspect you were speaking about it being immune driven. So following all of that, then it starts shedding. It sheds in the respiratory epithelium and then it is expelled in the respiratory epithelium at the same time that the symptoms are produced. So remember the virus is incubating for about five to six days. Incubation period is where there's no symptoms and then um, around, on average, day seven, you start developing symptoms of cough, fever, and so forth. And remember, cough, even if it is a cough that is dry, it can expel what we call droplets. So um, with uh, coughing and sneezing, there's, ex there's these droplets that are expelled. Droplets are much heavier, um, and these contain the virus, and these droplets will fall within, one would say, about a two-meter radius, up to a two-meter radius from this individual that is coughing. Um, the virus is within those droplets. The virus is not suspended in the air. It doesn't project further than that. So it's not aerosolized, it's not airborne. So we don't need to have concerns about that, but what we do need to know is the perimeter and how to protect ourselves within that. So anything within that um, up to two meters, that droplet spread, uh, can become infected with those droplets because those droplets can then either reside or uh, um, reside on, on maybe uh, tabletops, on, on sort surfaces, on tissues. The tissues we call fomites, other examples, pens, cell phones, those are inanimate objects which have the infection material on it. Um, so by touching that and then touching your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, then you can self-inoculate. So it's important to bear that in mind. That is how the virus is transmitted. Or if the individual directly coughs or uh, sneezes within that space and then your, it enters your um, respiratory epithelium or your mucosal surfaces. Um, 
The virus can be detected in stool, but that is shedding. It doesn't actually give an indication of disease there. And many viruses are shed in the stool anyway. But uh, so far, it's basically respiratory droplets. And it's within, like, like I said, a, a specific perimeter. And so that is why it is important to ensure that you do not touch your face if you have not washed your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Okay. And Lily, what about who is, who is transmitting or okay. when does the transmission occur? What do we understand about so, that? So, yes, we've spoken about the fact that there's an incubation, incubation period. So uh, individuals uh, who are incubating, we can say by day five, six, so about two days prior to the, to the symptoms starting, they can start shedding in their respiratory epithelium. But they are not as likely to expel the droplets as somebody who's already got symptoms. However, remember, in those two days, if you are busy sharing a teaspoon with that individual <laughs> or so forth, you, are like, you, you could well um, uh, acquire the infection. So it just depends on your proximity to that individual, okay, and the type of activity is involved. Then when the individual is symptomatic, obviously then there is uh, more likely um, a spread of the disease. And, and how infectious do they remain? Yes. So during, during the illness? Okay. So even after the symptoms have subsided, individuals can continue to shed asymptomatically. Um, in terms of how long, that is still, we, we do not know for certain, but it can even be for, for more than seven days. They can continue to shed asymptomatically within their from their respiratory epithelium. Yes. You have to use the microphone, otherwise they don't catch it. So. Um, is there a window period? So window period, um, imagining, usually when we say window period, we're referring to a, uh, a lab laboratory diagnosis kind of picture. So the, the, as long as there is virus, the PCR can pick it up. Remember the PCR is actually a molecular test that is highly sensitive and specific. It looks for the RNA of the virus itself. So if there is virus, and if that specimen has been collected appropriately, then the, um, the uh, molecular test, which is the PCR, can pick it up quite reasonably. But for that incubation period, that first five, four, four to five days when the individual is not shedding, we will not be able to pick up. So um, in individuals where there is a strong suspicion of COVID-19, where they have traveled to these countries, they have been in contact with another individual, if the first test, the initial test, and they are obviously uh, self-quarantined, and if the initial test is negative, repeat testing would be encouraged in individuals where you are suspecting the disease because then it could become, it could go from negative to positive. This is what happened with our third case, the third case who was the wife of the first case. Her initial test was negative and then subsequently became positive. Okay. Yeah, and, and the other thing to remember, it's not quite a your question, but similar, is that um, it's a PCR test. Yeah, it's testing RNA. Um, what we don't know is if we're detecting that virus RNA, is this from viable virus that will, that has the potential to cause infection or, or not? We, and what I was just reading earlier today, what they're saying in the UK is that with this, although the PCR is positive for several days, what they're starting to recognize is a, a lot of that is, is probably just, just remnant DNA, remnant RNA, but not from viable virus that would cause infection. So again, we, we will understand more about the kind of dynamics of, of the, the viral load and things. And, but for now, we're basing all our assumptions on the PCR being positive, but it may not mean that someone's infectious. Similar principle as the gene expert. Exactly. Uh, it's so isolating an individual who's symptomatic for 7, 14 days might not entirely be necessary. Just that we don't want to test regularly to see when they become negative. So the isolation, I, do, I know, I know. We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll 
I'm done. Okay. No, say, it, say it again. Okay. Otherwise so so the question really is that when you are isolating an individual that is symptomatic for the duration of the symptoms, I'm assuming that that isolation is to protect people around them from their getting infected. So based on what you are saying here, it might not be necessary to isolate them for that long. Correct. It may not be necessary, but it's, but it's unlikely that, that we'll change that practice um, because you're, like everything, you're taking the worst case scenario, isn't it, and basing your decisions on that. Um, Lily, it's uh, still you on how, how do we diagnose this infection? Okay, so um, I s we did speak a little bit about this. So there are highly sensitive tests, um, these uh, molecular tests. Now, you know, with uh, the virus, like I said, it is, resides within a cell. So there are three process, general processes that we do within molecular testing. That's extraction, amplification, and detection. And the extraction process is basically removing the RNA from the cell, so breaking open the cell membrane and removing that RNA. That RNA then goes to the procedure of amplification where multiple copies of that RNA is made to the point where it can be detected. So amplification and detection actually occur at the same time. It's called real-time PCR. PCR is polymerase chain reaction, which is simply one of the many types of amplification methods. Okay. So that is the molecular test that we, that we uh, do, and that is done at the NICD, like I mentioned. Um, the NICD is very strictly gatekeeping its, its tests for now. As you can imagine, we need to adhere to the case investigation. So if you require any information about the case investigation, um, the case uh, definition, sorry, uh, then you would need to look at the NICD website, which is www.nicd.ac.za. So all of the... Uh, case definitions are there in terms of who one should suspect COVID-19 in and who should be tested. Um, in terms of the, s the tests itself, so the, the actual tests, remember, because it's shedding from the respiratory epithelium, because it, it's uh, expelled from the respiratory epithelium, the gold standard is respiratory specimens. So the, in an individual who, is, um, who does not have a cough or does not have any productive um, sputum, one would take a nasopharyngeal swab and an oropharyngeal swab. So nasopharyngeal swab is from the nasopharynx, oropharyngeal swab, we're talking about a throat swab, which is basically swabbing the tonsils and the, back the posterior aspect of the, of the throat. So both these swabs are collected and then put into viral transport medium, which is a special medium um, that maintains the viability of the cells because the cells need to be viable so that we can have uh, the RNA maintaining its integrity, okay? And then we can test it appropriately. So that is sent across to the NICD lab and then it is tested as we mentioned. Um, sputum, so from an individual who does have a productive cough, sputum can be taken and then this would be mixed again with viral transport medium and sent to the laboratory. We do have serological testing as an adjunct. So in addition to the respiratory testing, serological testing can be done to monitor the immune response of the individual. So it will be taken at day naught and again at day 14. Um, and uh, then one would look at the teeters, and if there's a rise in teeters, we can say, okay, the, the individual has mounted an immune response. But like I said, the gold standard right now is just the respiratory uh, specimens, okay? Okay. Let me ask you a question. What about treatment? How are we going to treat this infection? Do we have any treatments? Purely symptomatic management at this stage. And take us through what, so what do we mean by symptomatic management? So if we look at our main symptoms, our main symptom was fever. So paracetamol or pathalgan would be our first line in that case. And then anti-inflammatories in case they have muscle aches and then supporting the immune system as much as possible. So supplements would also be advised at this stage. Yeah, and then obviously once you get the more severe end of the spectrum is where oxygen therapy and then we're gonna, with the critically unwell, we're thinking about intensive care support and ventilation and things. But why do we not have any treatments? So we've said that this is a family of viruses that cause illnesses. We've had two outbreaks with similar viruses. Why do we not have a treatment now that's ready to go for this infection? 
Viruses uh, undergo a process of change, so the antigenic drift or shift, um, and they change all the time, so I'd not imagine one treatment would suit, even though it may treat one family of viruses, it may not be specific to that antigen of the virus. So, so, so that's a good, a good point, that even if we had developed treatments against the first SARS or the MERS, they may not be active against this, this we don't know. But, I mean, the answer is basically a failure of medical science, like most things, is that we've had these pandemics and, and that have caused a lot of deaths around the world, but there wasn't enough research done uh, to, to develop treatments that might be ready for the next pandemic, which is now with us. And so we we uh, unfortunately this is what things happen what happens we get concerned about something and then it disappears and we forget about it and we don't plan for the next time it happens so there was some work done with the first SARS to to, to develop drugs and to test drugs but there wasn't enough done and so we're basically starting a little bit from scratch with this epidemic. We do have some drugs that we know in the lab work against coronaviruses. We have some drugs that there was some evidence might work against the SARS and the MERS. Um, and so they're currently in clinical trials. And, and what's in, encouraging is now we move so much quicker into getting clinical trials going to test out drugs so that this time hopefully we do develop drugs, vaccines, so that it help, may help later on with this, but also with the next, the next epidemic that comes. Any drugs that you've heard about that people are testing and trialing? Antiretroviral. Yeah, and which ones specifically? Uh, I'm not sure yet. V. Uh, not efavirenz, no, but the protease inhibitors. So that's the lopinavir, ritonavir especially. So there's some, there's some in vitro data that it's active, and there was some data against SARS and MERS that it might have clinical activity. So that's in, some, in clinical trials in China. We'll see. Um, one of the worries is that if people think that that's the answer to the problem, you might get lots of people trying to get hold of alluvia and calitra and, and use it to treat their mild, mild COVID-19 illness. And then people that really need it for their HIV will go short. And, and that's a real concern because it's happening in China that there's shortages of the, of the ARVs because they've used a lot in trials and things. Um, what, what about if somebody asks you the question, when are we going to have a vaccine? So, do you believe Donald Trump's answer to that question? Or do you have your own answer? Are we going to have one in time to help us here stave off this epidemic, do you think? No. No. Okay, exactly. It will take a year or 18 months or so. But what's amazing is that they have the vaccine candidates already. So they have developed the vaccine candidates. Like Lily said, because they could sequence the virus within a few days of the first case being identified, the people can then take that genetic sequence and can very quickly just plug it into their models and, and generate a vaccine candidate. Yeah? So that's been done now by a few groups around the world. And that's already going into phase one trials. So it's really remarkable. It's not quick enough to help us now, but it's remarkable that these things now can move at that speed. But it takes a year or 18 months to go through the full phase of animal human clinical testing and then to scale up manufacture on a scale that you can deliver it globally. So just to finish, and, and then we'll open it up to more general questions, just to give you a, 
up to date, or at least up to date as of yesterday, um, picture of where the epidemic has got to. Um, it's now affecting more than 100 countries, and there's been more than 100,000 confirmed cases. You'll see from the map that it's really spread globally. The one area that's as yet not so badly affected is our continent, Africa, but that is starting to change now. And there's now nine countries in Africa affected. And as you can see, we're out of date, and it's now seven confirmed cases in South Africa. You know the epidemic started in China, but China now has the epidemic under control. And in the last couple of days, fewer than 100 new cases each day reported from China, down from a peak of several thousand, 4,000, 5,000 a day. So the epidemic's really under control there. And these orange bars is then the rest of the world. And you can see that starting to accelerate. And this is just another way of showing this is all the cases um, outside China. I'm just showing the main areas that are growing are now this orange, which is Europe, and the purple, which is um, the Middle East and Iran. Um, and that's where there's most rapid spread at the moment. And this is just showing a number of different countries. This x-axis is the number of days fin since the first case was reported in the country. And this is the total number of cases on a logarithmic scale. So it's just really to illustrate that the growth of the epidemic is not uniform uh, in different places. It's slightly different. And it depends, again, on your response to the epidemic. Um, you can see some places like Iran spreading very quickly. Italy is now one of the main concerns, spreading extremely quickly and overwhelming their health system. We are now four or four, five days from the first case, and we've got seven cases. So we're sitting somewhere in the middle of this kind of jumble. So, the, so time will tell whether we follow a similar pattern or a more accelerated growth or possibly a less accelerated growth. We don't know, but it all depends on what action we take as a, as a health community and as a, as a community more widely. So I'm going to finish there and open it up for questions, concerns, things that you've heard that you want to ask about, other information you'd really like to help you to spread the correct information, and general questions. I just want to know how much is one test? For so the, the cost of the test, so Lily can answer from the, from the public sector, and then Prof was just showing us uh, something from Lancet Labs, where they've come up with how much it costs with them. OK, so the molecular testing is a relatively expensive test. However, now that everybody has the genetic sequences, different kits are being given to the different laboratories, and then so uh, it's being made available at cheaper prices. So offhand, I can tell you that it, it can be up to a thousand and more. But um, we are hoping that, you know, bearing in mind the funding that is available for COVID-19, maybe the testing will be subsidized, subsidized and so forth. How much are Lancet charging? 1,400 rands a piece. So it's, it's not cheap. So, so buy so be, your so shares before, in before Lancet we order the labs. tests, let's make sure that the individual you are testing fulfills all these criteria that we are talking about. How long does it take for a test to come out positive? Uh, come out positive or the result? Okay. 
Okay, so the turnaround time uh, for NICD um, to date, it was 24 hours from the time that the, the laboratory receives it. So n excluding specimen collection time, transportation, all of that, the turnaround time is 24 hours. However, one needs to bear in mind, now that they are being inundated with calls and more specimens, this may stretch a bit to, up I think the last time the Minister of Health said 48 hours. Yeah. Let's just bear it in mind. Um, should testing be decentralized in KZN, where would the testing facilities would be? Yeah, great question. Where I work. <laughs> so the <laughs> Department of Virology at Nkosi Albulutuli Central Hospital. So we, th it would be decentralized in KZN specifically to our laboratory. Um, in the past, there have been concerns regarding other virology tests going to Nkosi from around KZN that the turnaround time is actually quite long, uh, specifically related just to getting the sample. No, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to <laughs> Getting the sample to you guys has proven to be quite a challenge, yes. and that, that is concerning. So like I said, turnaround time is, is based on the time that it is received at Nkosi Albert Latuli Hospital or at the, 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 the site that is testing. So one has to look at all the pre-analytical problems, including specimen collection, specimen transportation, all of those factors which will in fact contribute. Um, so yes, we would hope that our structures are strong enough to provide the stability and the facilities that are required. And at the moment, Lily, so if, if you have a suspect case, and let's say we're here, yes. Uh, the, the sample is going same day courier to, to yes. NICD so, um, directly from here? Yes. So the specimens, um, if we have, let's say, a suspected case at this facility for a word, so then one would collect the specimens, one would first contact the NICD. There are now two hotlines, there are two hotline numbers available for individuals to contact because of the number of calls. Once the case has been discussed and the go-ahead has been given by NICD, then collect the specimens and your laboratory will send it directly via courier, same day, to NICD. Should I get uh, sick, say I get this virus and then maybe after a week uh, I'm diagnosed with COVID-19, does it mean all my colleagues, theater, everyone is going to go home because I'm working with them, my family and everyone? Does it mean everyone, like the people I, wa I work with, um, the, the theater staff, the nurses, everyone is going to go home, you quarantined? Not necessarily, because it depends when you became symptomatic yes. and, and when you then presented and got tested and things. So, so we're predominantly interested, we're going to be interested in the contacts during the time that you've been symptomatic. symptomatic. Okay, you'll, you'll remember we said We've said we don't know whether there is transmission in the asymptomatic mm -hmm. phase. It's possible, but we think most of the transmission is once you have symptoms. Mm -hmm. So if, if you develop symptoms and immediately stay off work and go and be assessed and be tested, then we may not be so concerned. And certainly if it's a week from today and you develop symptoms then, I'm not going to be concerned, mm. having spent time close to you today, because the chance of you being infectious today, if you only develop symptoms in seven days, is extremely small, yes. or non-existent. Um, <laughs> so, so, well, b and, and that's a very important message, that's a broader message, that this, this pandemic is going to teach us to be more strict with ourselves, about staying off work, staying off university when we are unwell with a respiratory illness. Yeah? Because staying off work or school or, or college is, is not about us, it's about protecting other people. And this is really going to bring that home and also not just for individuals but for employers and universities and things, it's going to make that clearer that when somebody says I'm not coming in for a couple of days because I've got the flu, that that's acceptable and that it's not that you're just skiving off work and you're surfing down the beach or whatever. It's that you are, you are ill, you're not at death's door, but you're unwell and you're protecting your 
colleagues and protecting patients. So what Richard is saying is that if you don't like anyone, invite them home. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's a real but it's a real challenge because as a health system we're going to be stretched and so if people start being off work doing the responsible thing and being off when they get symptoms even if it's just the common cold the health system is even more stretched so it's a real challenge to adhere and do the right things while also trying to, trying to contribute to the response and in whatever way. Um, do we know of anybody who has TB in the world also got COVID-19, or is that also unknown? So I'm sure there will have been, but we haven't seen any reports in the, in the literature yet of, of TB and COVID-19 co-infection. I mean, there's quite a bit of TB in China, so I'm sure there will have been cases, but just haven't seen reports. Do you want to maybe speak about the prevention? Yeah, you can. Shall we take that question and then you can? Uh, thank you, doctors. Um, regarding uh, face masks as a prevention tool, uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, are N95 masks the only effective face mask, or uh, are there alternatives? No, you, you can do it. <laughs> okay, so regarding the whole uh, concept of face masks, you know there are surgical masks and then there are these N95 masks. These N95 masks basically, are, um, they filter smaller particles um, and they are basically great, less than uh, 0.3 micromillimeters. Um, so that is how they differ from the surgical masks. Um, the N95 masks are useful for healthcare workers who are going to be exposed to, spe say, specimen collection, uh, chest physiotherapy, uh, actually attending to a confirmed case in an isolation ward, or doing, you know, bronchial alveolar lavages, those kind of settings. That's where you would use the N95. The N95 mask also has to be fitted specifically. A, sp a foot test needs to be done by an occupational um, doctor or healthcare worker in order to ensure that uh, it's, it's, going, you, it's going to be correctly used for that individual. And then it is ordered specifically per individual after that. So one needs to bear in mind you may have access to the N95s or you may not, but either way it may not provide the correct protection if it's not being used correctly. Not to mention all masks can become a source of infection because you when you put your mask on and then you are busy adjusting it, you have exposed your hands to everything that is on the mask anyway. So sometimes it actually ends up, if you're not using or not used to using a mask, you end up kept walking around with literally a source of infection on your face the entire day. So you just need to bear in mind, in terms of the use of masks, purely the best, the, the best thing for the mask, the best person for the mask is actually the person who is, in, who is coughing or sneezing, because you want to put that surgical mask on that individual so they do not expel their droplets further and infect other people. So that is the purpose of the mask. And you don't need to put an N95 mask on them because they don't need to filter in anything. We are preventing their droplets from being expelled. Okay, so that's important to bear in mind in terms of masks. Okay. In the case that we get called down to, say, intubate a patient, would then a N95 be sufficient to protect us in those cases? Intubation. So, so, yeah, so, so I mean, you're worried because it's an aerosol yes. generating procedure, yes. but a properly fit tested yes. N95 mask is adequate for that. But you would ideally want, in addition, a visor okay. or goggles. But we don't know, are they available? Do you have access to goggles, visors? We do. You do? Okay. So, visor but in essence, uh, it's okay, so it's not. You mean it's not, it's with the it's mask. Attached. It's attached. Oh, I see. Okay. Ideally, you want a separate mm. visor or or goggles. A visor is better. So, so ideally, what you want is a f a full gown, normal non-sterile gloves, the N95, and and the visor. That that's your 
PPE. Um, and that's and that's adequate for the for even the aerosol generating procedures. And you also you must be very careful on as to how you put on the PPE. That's called donning, and how you take off the PPE. That's called doffing, because um, the sequence in which you do it can may result in you self inoculating if you don't do it correctly. So you can have all the protective gear, but then do it incorrectly and still infect yourself. I just want to, con I just want to contextualize your risk. I mean, the risk of you getting the infection might be high because you are doing what you are doing. But for you as an individual, the risk of having a severe infection is extremely small, and the risk of dying is exceedingly small. So just keep that in mind. I mean, the chances are if you're intubating a patient with TB, you're at higher risk of getting a serious disease than it is with somebody who's got this infection. Oh, OK. So. Let's say the person is being cured of this uh, virus. What are the chances that the virus will reactivate in the future or, or something like that? Re reinfect them or, yeah, it's a great question. And again, that's one of the things we don't have an answer to yet. We don't know. So we don't know if you develop protective immunity after infection. We're starting to get data that's saying as, we, as, as normal with viral infections, you, you get an antibody response, IgM, IgG, but we don't know for sure whether that's protective. And we don't know whether, whether the virus will change and, and there's a possibility of reinfection. There's been some case reports saying, ooh, this looks like somebody's being reinfected because their PCR changed from positive to negative and then back to positive. But usually you find these cases are not convincing evidence of reinfection, but rather that just the, maybe there was a low titer PCR positive that was, was just became negative and positive. So, so we don't know. We hope that, that there will be protective immunity and, and, and that that will, that people won't be reinfected. We'll start to understand in not too distant future in China, I think, as, as they relax the, all, the, all the kind of public health measures they've done there and allow people to mix again, we'll start to see whether people get reinfected and, and, and get disease again. So are you all happy that you have a little bit more information now and that you can go and start spreading some of this information out there? Yeah, hopefully. Okay, great. Is there anything else that you would have liked us to cover? Or if we go to another hospital to do the same similar session, what would you suggest that we include or not include? Or do you think that's about the right kind of content? And um, what, is it advisable to do domestic traveling at this time? Like <laughs> to fly to Cape Town or Joburg? As, so, as international. Oh, wow. so, so we were discussing that on the way up, on the way uh, up the road here. Uh, and, and I think, for, I mean, for now, there's no reason not to domestically travel, okay? The international travel is more complicated and depends on a lot of things. And, and you've got to remember that the picture we see today in any place in the world is reflecting transmission a week or two weeks before. And things are moving so quickly. So um, what we're starting to say is that really we're advising against any non-essential travel to parts of the world where there's clear evidence of transmission going on. And that's now quite a lot of places. So I mean, I was due to go on holiday back to the UK beginning of April. I will almost certainly cancel that because it's just not, again, not, from, not to protect myself, because I'm not particularly worried. If I get it like Prof says, I'll probably be OK. Um, but to protect other people 
and to make sure that I don't come back and then can't contribute to, to work again. And then Prof will get upset that I'm not, not helping him. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, e difficult. And again, the way, the way we're thinking about it changes day by day as, as we're thinking more. Okay, thanks for coming. Thank